Welcome to the Let's Talk About Church Safety and Security podcast, where we discuss the issues churches face protecting their flock while maintaining a Christ-centered focus with your host, Paul Buckner. So Sheepdogs, I wanted to talk today about something very near and dear to my heart, and that is the importance of who we recruit for our security team. And and this really matters. Um, And there's all kinds of extremes that can go with this. And I'm going to tell you, none of this is really unique to me. There's so much within the church safety space that others have said, maybe they've said it differently, or maybe we just haven't heard about it yet. So um, who we re- who we recruit, though, for our, our safety team, our security team is incredibly important. So a lot of times we get off on the wrong foot and we start in the wrong place. Like it's really it's really easy to do these things like we um, I remember the very first security team that I started on and we were we were only really concerned about an active shooter, an active killer. And so our, our thought process was, well, then we're going to need um, who likes to hunt and who has a concealed carry permit. And that sort of, that's sort of um, an understandable place to start with. It's sort of like starting a trucking company and going who out there likes to drive, um, as opposed to saying, well, who has a good driving record and, and who has the integrity to haul these loads and not steal from us? And, you know, so who's that safe driver? Who's that person that maybe we can, we can help them get a CDL and put them through the schooling. And that's, that's basically where I'm going with this is many of my instructors. And I've been fortunate to train with a lot of, of different folks over the years. You'll hear me say often that I drink from a lot of different fountains. Um, I, I've been blessed to train with folks who've really affected and impacted my mindset on this. And I think I really started, I mean, 12, 13 years ago, I think I really started in the wrong place uh, where in my mind, it was all about the gun. And it was, it was the necessity of, of preventing, preventing an active shooting was really all I was concerned about. And I think that's where a lot of us again, start. And so I'm, I'm going to talk about some of my feelings and where I started in the wrong place. And I started and ran a security team um, for a decade. And uh, my background, because for the, some of you who are going to stumble across this, the audio or the video version of this, you're not going to have a clue who I am. But so I am a civilian police chaplain in the American Midwest. I have served, served alongside law enforcement for about 13 years. Um, as a civilian, I have been out of the vehicle fighting bad guys. It gives me a unique perspective on law enforcement from the private citizens viewpoint. And I actually have a chaplain for cops called Beside the Badge. I have a chaplain. I have a podcast for cops called Beside the Badge. I'm also a very human individual, if you can't tell. And so I, I've gotten to be the tackle dummy for a lot of different training, whether it was, whether it was people uh, were, were going to be doing room entry from a law enforcement level and they needed a bad guy. So I was up for opposition force for that and got to shoot some of my cop buddies with airsoft guns and, and help to train and sharpen them. So I've, I've been able to do that. I've trained in executive protection. I do executive protection for ministries and I've been in some pretty hairy situations over the years. Um, the church that I was plugged into for about 25 years, we saw violence at our church. Uh, fortunately, no shootings, uh, shootings, but there was um, a lot of drug traffic. We were we were hemmed in between two drug and neighborhoods. And so we saw a lot of methamphetamine fueled stupidity and had a great harvest that came out of that where a lot of people came to Christ. But had a guy attack me one night while I was trying to lock up the church and I had to draw on him and we had um, we actually had uh, an electrical outlet catch on fire. I mean, got to see a lot of interesting things that a lot of different churches don't see. Um, a friend of mine who's with a, a mega church is like, "Where did you go to church?" And uh, he's like, "We have like fifteen thousand people that go to our church, and we've never seen that stuff." So I think the Lord used that as a literal baptism of fire to help me to realize, hey, a lot of what you're focused on is not actually the thing to focus on. So I want to talk about for a moment what we what we need to understand about church security and then about preparing a team. And so um, you literally, if, if, you, if you take 100%, and you can play percentages and averages in your direction. So I'm just going to use like a soft percentage just to make this make sense. 100% likelihood you will have a medical emergency on your campus. At some point, a child will fall, they'll scrape their knee, and that's on the extreme minor scale. To um, at my last church, a teenager ran over his girlfriend. Um, he was being a goober and didn't realize it that she was behind him, and he actually hit her and ran over her leg. Um, I'm trying to think of what all we had happen. Um, you have people that end up being transported for heart attacks. 
Um, I've seen someone go into a uh, very terrible seizure and actually their body went rigid and they started just jackhammering, uh, jackhammering out a seizure. Um, so you've got all kinds of different, uh, we had a lady fall down the stairs. Um, we actually had that happen a couple of different times. And uh, so at that point you're calling 911, you're getting an ambulance on the way and you're going to have a medical emergency, whatever that looks like. And that's why you need three layers of protection. And there's all these things when you start down the street that you can learn where you start outside your church in the parking lot. There's a church where a lady actually, she started having a heart attack, didn't realize she was having a heart attack, just didn't feel well, walked out to her vehicle and nobody followed her out. Nobody checked on her. Did They did not have a security presence in the parking lot. And within 40 feet is my understanding of the front doors of the church. She collapsed and died. Now it's entirely possible and I'm not ridiculing that church. It's just a lot of churches don't have a security presence. And so we can, we can find ourselves in a situation where something like that can happen. Um, I was at a friend of mine's church and I'm going to interview him one of these days where we were, I was actually shadowing him. And that's a great way to learn, by the way, is to, is to go visit with other churches and maybe work that around your service times and, and go catch one of their services and see how they do things. Talk to their team leaders and the people who have been doing it a long time. You can really shorten your learning curve. And then there's just things like this where, where if you have um, podcasts and broadcasts and people you can listen to, they can point you to fantastic resources. And there's tons of books out there. Some of my good friends have written a lot of those books. So you have um, amazing resources today that we didn't have 13 years ago. But you will have a medical emergency at your church. And so because of that likelihood, understanding CPR, signs of a stroke, signs of a heart attack, understanding um, if somebody gets lacerated terribly, that they can asanguinate, they can bleed to death in, in I mean, 90 seconds or less. And um, I've heard of but not seen uh, footage of someone actually bleeding to death in less than a minute. And so having having a stop the bleed, having stop the bleed training, hugely important. Understanding that you you need a trauma bag, you need a first aid kit, but a trauma bag is something completely separate. And if somebody is bleeding to death, I've never had anybody who was bleeding to death say, please don't help me. And uh, I've been fortunate in my time beside the badge as a chaplain to, I've seen tourniquets applied in different things. And I've had um, coagulate impregnate coagulant impregnated bandages that I have given officers actually help them. I had a young man uh, call me and thank me uh, because a uh, bandage I'd given him actually helped him. He took a ricochet during uh, some some practice shooting at the range and actually hit him in the in the arm. And he was bleeding not to death, but he was bleeding. Um, the importance of medical training, I cannot, I cannot overstate that. There is a hundred percent likelihood you'll have that happen. And then a fire it's much less likely. I, I like to use round number percentages, and I like to say you've got a 10% chance of a fire. Um, and that's one of the things that we've got to get over as a culture is a lot of churches and a lot of businesses that really need to have trauma gear. I was at a machine shop recently that had no trauma gear of any kind. And one of their employees was talking about like three different instances where he was seriously, seriously injured on the job. Um, over his career, not even at that company, but just over his career, where he could have bled to death just due to the the fun part of working at a machine shop. And I actually know of a man, um, I had dropped off medical gear with a dealership. It just really felt like God was leading me to do this. And I got a call about two weeks later from their service manager saying, hey, FYI, thank you for that gear. Um, one of my guys was using a grinder with a cutoff wheel and, and it exploded into his hand, my understanding, and he was bleeding profusely. And uh, the, the tourniquet actually helped me to cut off the blood flow to his hand and keep him from bleeding more. And of course, with, you know, blood thinners and all these different things that we're dealing with. And so you'll definitely have a medical emergency, but our culture focuses on things like active shooters and fires. And we don't really think as much about the medical side of it. And I, I maybe that's a bias on my part, but I have talked to so many churches that they're like, yeah, we actually started the wrong way. And we actually started focusing on this and we should have been focused on that. And I'm like, wow, that's that's interesting because we kind of did too. So in churches today, a lot of it's because of the fact that we have um, city ordinances and state laws and federal laws. Um, and I'm, I'm not a big law guy. I mean, I'm very um, libertarian at heart. But unfortunately, those laws are there because people don't won't take the time to take care of themselves. So bringing it around, 
Um, we have fire extinguishers and we have smoke detectors in our churches. And a lot of people, you know, if you have a, a fryer, you, there's a special kind of fire extinguisher for that in your kitchen and, and all these different things and, and every, you know, near exits and all these different things you're supposed to have fire extinguishers. I live in an area that there, there either are not those ordinances or those codes and what have you are not enforced. And so there's a lot of people that get away with things that they shouldn't. I had a conversation with a business owner recently that I commented, hey, your fire extinguisher is expired. It's in the red on the gauge. There's a little green window and that's where that's where you're that's the happy place for your fire extinguisher to be. And they're like, yeah, there's a lot of things around here that don't work. And so unfortunately, there's there are reasons for those codes to be enforced because a lot of times we don't take the time to do that ourselves and we set ourselves up for liability and for tragedy because I would I would struggle to forgive myself if somebody ran to one of my fire extinguishers thinking it was going to work and it didn't uh be, and I knew that it had failed and then they they ended up passing away or getting injured I'd feel terrible so think of your trauma gear and your trauma training as being like that fire extinguisher and that smoke alarm it's there if you need it but you probably won't ever need it you hope you never need it I've needed all of the above, which is crazy. And I, I really believe God brought me through this journey, this literally like a baptism of fire. And then let's get down to violence. Now, my church saw violence. We saw uh, guys pull in the parking lot and get into fistfights, road rage style. There was violence on our campus. We saw, um, we saw custody situations. We saw an attempted abduction. We saw, I'm trying to think of what all, we had a, we had a, um, a domestic violence situation two or three times. And then we saw a lot of drug fueled stupidity. We had a guy threaten to kill our pastor. We had a lady threaten to kill our pastor. Um, we had probably a dozen break-ins at our church. I, that's probably a low number. I don't know how many times I would get calls as a security team leader. You need to go down to your church you know, from, from a member of law enforcement or from my pastor saying, Hey, go down to the church. There's cops that are going to meet you there. Every light in the church is on and all the doors are standing wide open. And we, we ultimately figured out half of it was a kid that went to church there that was going around when nobody was looking, he'd unlock a window and then he could sneak in at night and he thought it was funny. And um, we eventually got that pretty much handled, but we also had some very dangerous situations where there were adult men breaking into the church and they would spend the night in the church or they would steal from the church. And we knew who a couple of them were and we tried to minister to them. They didn't want ministered to, which was the really sad thing. They, they, we offered them food and water and all these different things that no, 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 I'm not going to take that from you. I'm going to steal from you. I'm not going to take your gift. I'm going to steal from you. And one of the man's lives ended in tragedy. And, um, and I don't think he made it to heaven and not judging, but I don't think he ever made a decision for Jesus. And so violence, if violence is a very real threat, but the likelihood of church violence striking your church is actually extremely low. So what I'm not doing is downplaying the need. So do not hear that. I'm not downplaying the need. We need to have a, a presence. And if you are allowed by your state law, and if you are allowed by your, um, your congregation, by your, um, if you're part of a denomination or a diocese or whatever that looks like, if they allow an armed security presence, um, then, then I would highly encourage you to, uh, get trained and it's, it's anybody can ride a bicycle around the block a few times and, and be able to ride. Okay. But the guys that are doing BMX bike tricks and are, are at the top of their game, they've been doing it for a lifetime. And the same thing's true with firearms. You're not going to take a pocket carry revolver and save the day with absolutely no training. Odds are you'll be another statistic. So please train. If you, if you, if you followed me for several years now doing this, you'll, you'll know that I, I really harp on training, train, 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 train. You can never train too much for a job that can get you killed. And there's so many things to understand when it comes to firearms training. I mean, you understanding cover and concealment, understanding ballistics, what your, what your bullet will do, understanding the differences in calibers and, and not carrying something that will over penetrate a target, understanding the dynamics of what that's going to look like in a crowd and how you have to be able to potentially move in a crowd. I go to a, a large church, over 1,500 people, and I, that's a fairly large church. I've got friends that go to churches that are 10 times that size and then some. But understanding how to carry, what to carry, understanding the, the laws in your state, uh, having a, a type of carry insurance. I use U.S. Law Shield, there's U.S. CCA, there's others. I say insurance, but it's it's basically you're putting a law firm on retainer is essentially what you're doing through and through a company. 
and being able to ask those questions. And so um, what does that look like? What is a police response going to look like? And uh, understanding that your church security team is not a SWAT team. And unless you're extremely rural, odds are that law enforcement will be, will be there very quickly. Understanding that you probably will not be able to run out to your truck or your vehicle and grab some kind of a truck gun and come back in. It's going to cost lives. It's a come as you are situation. And I've had people say, well, I've actually staged in my truck. I've got a lockbox. I can run up and I can pull it. I can roll this thing out and bloop, I'm in and I've got body armor. I've got a rifle. I've got extra mags. And understanding that about every eight seconds, um, that's not a hard and fast number, but a person can die every few seconds or a person can be shot to Swiss cheese every few seconds. And a lot of people don't die during shootings from the actual bullet. They die from bleeding to death. And if you look at what happens statistically, or if you look, if you look at what actually happens during shootings, um, especially there's, there's been uh, terror attacks that have really raised our awareness of these things. And then some mass shootings around the world, um, some of which are not very well known in the United States. Um, so all of those things are very real concerns. Now I've covered all of that. Now let's talk about who you don't necessarily want on your team. Um, the word of God, Proverbs talks about, do not, do not friend an ill-tempered man, lest you learn his ways. Well, let me put you in a very real situation. Um, I saw a meme the other day that said, um, if we ever find ourselves in a situation where I'm the voice of reason, we're all in trouble or something like that. Um, you don't want somebody who's an ill-tempered person. And I've, I've worked around environments before where people had to be, they had to be stood down off of their team because they did not have, they had the bedside manner of a piranha and we have to have a Christ focused ministry, uh, heart. So I'll give you, I'll give you a scenario. Somebody comes to your church, um, something's not quite right. Uh, maybe they smell, um, their clothes are disheveled and, we have to remember that that homeless person or that person with the mental instability issues, a lot of those people are who flocked to Jesus and those people need salvation. Those people need people to, to care for them and care about them. And we shouldn't be just turning them away arbitrarily. And I've had people say, well, we don't want you here. You stink. Wait, what? Like Jesus, uh, would probably be, is flipping out in heaven when we say that. And so when, when somebody has an attitude, an exclusivity attitude, and they have this, oh, no, you can't be here. You don't fit our mold. This is a church for these kinds of people. <clears throat> we're, doing, we're doing church wrong. And so that exclusivity attitude needs to be out. You have to have a, Christ, a Christ-centered mindset. You have to have, you need to be saved. You need to have a, a vibrant relationship with Christ. You can't give away what you don't have. And I could, I could tell you a dozen stories about church security teams, safety teams that have actually led people to Christ in their parking lot or halfway up to their door who were struggling with something. And uh, one guy, I can't find the, the story now, but I think it was in Texas. And he, he actually got out of his vehicle with a baseball bat, was confronted. He was coming towards the door aggressively. And he was, he was taking the baseball bat and whacking the side of his, his um, foot, the side of his shoe as he was walking up to the door. Well, that's, that's self-harm. And that's a very dangerous thing to see somebody doing. Somebody who's inflicting self-harm, um, that's bad. And so obviously the guy had all the signs of, of violence and he was coming towards the building. They called 911. Two guys confronted him. One of them swept his suit jacket back and he, he showed that he was armed. He's like, hey, hey, you know, and the, the guy's like, he said something to the effect of, I'm mad at God and I, or my wife left me and I'm mad at God and I came here to make God pay. And a friend of mine pointed out that that, that is the sin that Satan had when he thought he could be like God and, and went to war with God. And that lasted about a split second and he got kicked out of heaven. Um, he couldn't hurt God. So who did he go hurt? Adam and Eve. He couldn't hurt God. So he hurt God's creation. He, he hurt the things that God loved. And so sin hasn't really changed much, has it? If at all. Right. And so when my friend kind of shared that with me, I was like, wow, that's, that's good. That's amazing. And people do that to this day. They can't hurt God and they're mad at God. So what are they going to do? They're going to go to God's house and try to hurt God's people. Ouch. That's about dead on. Right. And so being able to witness to somebody, having a relationship with God, top, top shelf, top importance, everything else can be taught. So I'm going to tell you, there's two things that I would look for in somebody immediately, immediately if I was starting a security team. Uh, number one is, do they have a servant's heart? 
And I think that they should be willing to serve for quite a while in another environment. Our church does six months. You have to serve six months in another environment before you can serve in our security function. For us, you had to be a member of the church for a year. And, and you may have alarming conversations with people. I literally had a guy that came up to me uh, at my last church. And he's like, hey, he's like so-and-so. And this guy was brand new. He'd only been there once. I'd seen him come in. And he kind of he struck me as off a little um, he was definitely what we would call a doesn't look right. And I was like, hmm. And it was just something about the, the whole of how he presented himself that kind of set off an alarm bell for me, a red flag. And so this guy comes up and says, hey, says, hey this guy's new. It's his first Sunday here. He would like to join our security team. Red flag. And the guy says, yeah, he says, you know, we, we just had this shooting and I forget which one it was. It might have been Sutherland Springs. And the guy's like, I want to, I want to carry a gun and I want to protect a church. He isn't saved. He does not know the Lord. He doesn't attend church anywhere. He's not serving in any capacity and doesn't have a servant's heart. To a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And that's why we've got to be careful about the mindset of the people we put in a security position. And I started making up, I was a security team leader. I started making it policy on the spot. I was like, well, you have to be a member of our church for about a year. And, and you know, we need you walking with God. And, and, um, and then we go through and we do a background check. And it was within moments, this guy was like, well, I'll find another church. Bye. And I pray nobody let him do that. Um, because he, the people on your security team need to know the Lord. Now, if you're hiring a deputy or a police officer to stand at the door, that's a different conversation, but it's also a ministry opportunity. And I happen to love those because at my church every week, I've got a captive audience and I'm kind of like the apostle Paul, they chained in between two Roman soldiers and I get to visit with those guys and do life. And over time, some of those guys go to our church and I love that. It's also an opportunity for that police officer or that deputy to see people that they probably don't have to arrest who are, are being nice to them and thanking them for their service. And they're like, this has been really cool. It's my favorite part of my month or my week when I get rotated to be here uh, because I'm getting paid to hang out with people where there's probably not going to be a problem. And our church pays pretty decently. So um, that's another good thing to think about because in a situation where something goes south, we treat our deputy that's at our door uh, like a fire extinguisher in case of emergency break glass. And so we handle minor things. You know, if somebody if somebody's coming in and we need to visit with them. Um, we had a guy try to go into our kids area. Uh, this has actually happened a couple of different times. And that's, I'm going to add that back to that threat matrix. Um, one of the biggest things that we really need to be concerned about is background checks for our people and making sure that anybody that gets anywhere near our children is background checked because, and, and I know churches that they do it with their facilities people, they do it with people that work in their cafe, they do it with their door greeters, just because they could potentially have access to somebody's child. And pedophiles are a real threat to a church. And um, there's a terrible history of, of pedophiles targeting churches as soft targets. And so bringing this around, um, if you have somebody who they may have amazing training in this one area like i have friends that if there's an active shooter an active killer i want them on my team like their their entry skills their 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 rifle skills their handgun skills are on point but they don't have the de-escalation skills and you, you're gonna you're gonna you win 100 percent of the fights you don't have to fight and i've had to de-escalate people in real world situations i started with the book verbal judo which is a great primer uh or as they say over the pond a great prima and, uh, but then I started, I started listening to and learning from the wealth of information that is John Riley with general response. Check him out. After medical training, I would definitely go for de-escalation. And that's a tough one for me because I'm almost like de-escalation first, but get whatever you can and get it as fast as you can learn from guys like John, John Riley and, and, uh, um, follow him on social media. He's got some amazing gold nuggets. I interviewed him a while back. He's a fantastic guy, just a wealth of, of knowledge. But somebody who has one skill set, I liken it to one arrow in their quiver. Um, if they only have their gun for skills and they have no, they have no soft skills of any kind, they have no de-escalation skills, they have no weapons retention skills, and that's something to look up is earning your draw, knowing that somebody may try to take your weapon from you as you draw it. The average American needs about four seconds to draw a gun, and the average bad guy needs about a tenth of a second. I'm being, I mean, I'm not giving you a hard and fast number, but they need a fraction of a second to pull a trigger. And uh, being able to, to complete our draw stroke is important, but maybe that person has a sub one second draw stroke and they're, they're a competitive shooter, but they have a terrible temper. 
I don't want them on my security team. Now they might, they might make a great sleeper as I like to call them because it sounds very Jason Bourne, but um, I jokingly call it that where that person would be amazing backup if the worst should happen in case of emergency break glass, this guy's going to come in. Um, I had a veteran friend that he great guy, but he understood. He's like, I was not trained to be nice to people. I was trained to, to kick butts. You know, you, as uh, John Riley talks about, he's a, an army veteran. He's a law enforcement veteran. He's like, you, you locate the enemy, you fix the enemy's position and you eliminate the enemy. That is infantry training. And he said, um, we were not trained to de-escalate. We were not trained to do these things. And so that's a very, very real situation. And <clears throat> so you have these amazing skill sets, or you may have somebody that has the most amazing de-escalation skills in the world, but they don't have that sheepdog heart. They don't have the mindset of looking. They don't have a desire to serve in that capacity. So you're looking for somebody that has the sheepdog heart and they, they're looking after the kids. And a lot of times they'll say things to you like, <clears throat> You know who do we have out here watching over the kids in the in the playground area or or i'm really concerned about people driving fast through the parking lot somebody could get hit um you know uh, i noticed this door didn't get locked the other day and when i came to the church i noticed one of the doors was unlocked uh, that can be things that can can make you go oh this this person could be right for the job you can train all those other skills and so church safety is a very multifaceted thing so going back Somebody may have, they may be a one hit wonder. They've got this one amazing skill and that's fantastic. And so I told my friend that I said, you know, we're going to paint you blue and paint you half blue and give you a, a giant sword and stick you in a closet if we ever need you because he, he didn't have the escalation skills and he knew it. And so he would actually escalate a situation. It was a potential. He would escalate a situation if we ever found ourselves in one and so there is a place for the guy that will pick somebody up and body slam them. But that's like in the one tenth of a percent, if that uh, of an instance that's ever going to happen. So, I mean, here's what's likely to happen way down here, almost, almost never going to happen. And we don't want to put ourselves in a situation where that's all that person has to bring to the table. And let's go back to that passage in Proverbs. Do not befriend an ill-tempered man, lest you learn his ways. Imagine finding yourself in a situation where somebody with a, with a bad temper or someone who has no de-escalation game at all and is actually almost looking for that fight. They're a hammer mindset. Their mindset is a hammer. Everything looks like a nail. And they find themselves in a situation where they need to de-escalate somebody who's coming to the church to, they want you to do something that will let them sue you. And that's becoming an increasing threat. We don't want to put ourselves in a situation where that's who we have to go to bat with. Now, let's put some teeth on this. Let's give this real world application. So you are trying to deescalate a situation and somebody's trying to come in the door. This is public property. Actually, it's not. Um, I can come here. Freedom of speech. I can say whatever you want. Well, you have the right to speak freely, but you're on private property and you're interrupting a church service. And by the way, know your state's laws, know your city's laws or know your city's ordinances because there's a very real chance if somebody is interrupting a church service in your city or in your state that they actually can be arrested or at least given a court date. They can be trespassed and what have you. So imagining all those things. So um, if you if you find yourself in a situation trying to de-escalate somebody like this, and then you've got somebody that injects themselves into the situation, this is why having two or three people there where you can you see the hammer coming and you're like, this isn't a nail. They You, you don't need to just pound this person into the floor. And they come up and and they're they're going to handle this. Well, a gentle answer turneth away wrath. It's one of my favorite uh, Bible verses, and it's also where gentle response that John John Riley, who's I I'm very stuck on his training. I love his training. It's really impacted me and helped me de-escalate situations as a chaplain. Um, writing with departments, and you find yourself in the middle of a volatile situation with too few cops, and you're able to help de-escalate something that could have gotten violent. And so imagine you find yourself in that situation and your, your blood pressure is rising and you're stressed, that adrenaline is starting to pop. You feel that little pop of adrenaline hit. And as you're trying to keep yourself under control, this person is not being a voice of reason. And you need to be able to take a step back. It's something John teaches. It's very important to be able to tag, tag and let somebody else take over. We're not going to be able to reach everybody. Go back and watch that interview that I did with John. And he's done a bunch of great interviews in the past. And uh, he's done some with the church safety guys. I used to be part of that. I'm very proud of that legacy. And so go back and watch those. A lot of gold nuggets there. A lot of good stuff. So don't put yourself in a position where the only arrows in your quiver 
are are going to make situations worse. And then you've got to make sure that the people also have that sheepdog heart because there is a time when it's go time. And I had a guy years ago that I love the guy to death, but I had to stand him down off my team because we found ourselves in a very volatile situation and, and at least twice. Uh, and I'd have to stop and think about it. It's funny how things start to run together over time and you forget details, but we had a couple of guys that were mules. They were running drugs. They tried to duck into our church and hide from the cops. Not good. You could have a hostage situation. There's a dozen things that could go south with this. And so um, we pray. Unless God watches over the city, the watchmen watch in vain. We pray for safety and we should be doing that as security teams. So these guys pull in the parking lot like 50 miles an hour. And I got to set the stage for this. I got a guy in the parking lot. He's got a radio. He didn't want to be armed. And that's fine. Not everybody needs to be armed. Depends on your team and your team culture. So this guy, these, this car pulls in the parking lot at 50 miles an hour. And God had set about in motion. He had ordained that several different high-speed individuals that were part of my team or attended my church, people that had the heart to step in if something went south, uh, would actually be in the parking lot. One guy had come to me, said, hey, my wife isn't feeling well. She thinks her, her blood sugar's uh, dropping. Do you have something in your car that would maybe help that? And I did. And so I had a couple of snacks in the car that would have helped her with that. Mentioned that to him. He goes, that's perfect. We go to step outside. He was a member of my team. I obviously ran the team. And I had a guy on my team that was like a Philistine. The guy was, I'm 6'4", and he towered over me. He was at least 6'8". And he was a big, big dude. And um, so he had stepped outside to call his wife. She was home not feeling well. As I recall, he checked on her. And we had a member of our of our um, our board. One of our elders had stepped outside. He was a concealed carry permit holder. He'd gotten a call from work. And God had just kept doing these things where we had like, I think it was like six members of my team team five six members of my team and another guy outside all of which were either armed or on the team and so um as i step outside i immediately see a a vehicle that that got my attention flying through the parking lot one red flag driving really fast second one was it was it was beat up to the point that it probably had been the victim of violence like this car had gone through some bad stuff that wasn't just normal driving and I look because of my time riding with police departments, and this is a really great thing to look for. The plates were expired by four years. Okay, something's up with that. And so not one of these things is not necessarily like, oh my gosh, call 911, but all of these together are a problem. And so this, this materialized very quickly, and that's how these situations go. Bam, they go quick. Flies through the parking lot. These guys looked rough, and they had the look of people who abuse drugs. And so I'm like, okay, we have a potential for violence. What are they doing here? Are you know you don't want a gun battle between drug dealers on your property? Why are they doing this? And then they hide. They bury their car in the back, and they jump out and they start like like almost running to the building. And my guy that was in the parking lot had no sheepdog. He he didn't have any mindset to look at the situation. And he's like, hey guys, we in a hurry to go to church this morning. That was his. You know, and he didn't think he needed to use his radio. So I step out as all this happens and I realize this guy is not getting it. Like this, this is, could be a very, very bad situation. At the very least, we need to alert the team. And so, and this all, all took place in a matter of seconds. I, I turned to the guy I was with. I said, hang on one second for me. I walked over to these guys and I dressed professionally. That church asked me to wear a suit jacket and uh, slacks. And so I, I always dressed very professionally. And it does have an impact impact on how people respect you, it, how you dress. It happens with police officers. It happens with our military. The way that we dress and present ourselves, even even just in business, has a major impact on how people perceive us, even subconsciously. So as I come walking up to these guys, I'm like, "Hey, guys, how's it going?" And they boom, they turn to look at me, and you could tell they're like, "I smell bacon." I mean, like you could tell they're thinking this guy's a cop. And I said, "I said, how are we doing?" And I, I turn, I start walking with them, and I am not liking the vibe I'm getting. And uh, they're like, oh, yeah, we're just running late for church. And I'm like, OK, cool. And I was like, first time in, I haven't seen you folks before. And I'm like, you know, welcome. And I'm, I'm being what they call aggressively friendly. I'm being very friendly, but I'm being aggressively friendly. And so as this is going on and I'm walking up with them, I can tell they are super, super nervous. And all my alarm bells are going off. And they see this member of my team step out to call his wife in turn. And, you know, the guy's like the size of a tree. And they just stopped. And there was uh, more to this conversation as, as we were walking. I was asking them questions that were friendly questions, but I'm trying to get answers. And they saw this guy and they freaked out and they spun around and they started back the other way. And as they went and jumped in their car, um, 
I called in uh, non-emergency, which is that's a number you need to have in your phone is your area's non-emergency number, whether it's for your city or your county. You may have a centralized dispatch for your entire county like we do, or you may have one specific to your city. Find that out, get that saved in your phone, and then know your church's address. So I talked to the dispatcher. I said, hey, can you have an, have an officer call me? And I knew who was on duty that morning. And he calls me. He's like, hey, and he had my number already. I, I, I was his chaplain. And uh, but but get that person to call you. And he goes, hey, brother, what's up? And I said, vehicle description, direction of travel. This is what happened. He's like, which way did they go? OK, I'm hunting for those guys. They are drug dealers. They are they are they are mules. They're transporting drugs. And the only time you see that vehicle is when they're transporting drugs. A lot of these folks don't take good care of their vehicles. And um and uh, they don't obey traffic laws and they, they don't fix their turn signals and their, and, their, uh, and their headlights and their brake lights and all this stuff. They don't take care of those things. They don't stop at stop signs and, and they, because they have no respect for the law and also because they're abusing drugs, that's where all their money goes. And uh, which is, so it, there's a lot of indicators there that I was like, man, this is, something's up with this. Now imagine if they'd gone into our church, the officer had pulled into the parking lot and these people had decided to take a hostage and um, and we'd had a hostage standoff or they decided to stab or shoot someone because they're tripping on drugs. They look at some little old lady and they're like, you narc. And then we got a problem. And so God was good. He was with us. I, I stood the guy down. I had a conversation with him and he still didn't get it. And I realized this is this is a mistake. And I at that time, the church that I went to, they put people on my team, which you, you have to trust your team leader. Um, you build a police department by bringing in a chief or you build a sheriff's department by, by bringing in a sheriff that will build that culture under them where they they have the respect of the, of the troops. And you have to be able to trust and give latitude to your security team lead and they have to trust and, and obey you. And I mean that. I, I serve at the pleasure of the church uh, board and of the pastors that I report to. That's how that works. I serve God and I, and I serve at the pleasure of these individuals and not always are the two going to see eye to eye. That's how that works. That's a conversation for another podcast. But um, going back, um, th that's a real world application for having the right mindset. So you don't want somebody that's overboard and they, they're like, what are you looking at, Grandma? Make a move. Make a move. You don't want somebody that's that extreme. And, and I remember de-escalating a guy, um, talking to a guy. And I really, I actually wasn't really truly de-escalating. I was just kind of watching a situation and he was in a store, he was causing problems and, and he was, you could tell he was mentally ill and had a, a real aggressive attitude towards women. So I'm, I'm cautiously, quietly watching the situation, making sure if he gets violent because of his words and his demeanor, he could, and they ultimately trespassed him and he got himself into some trouble over time. But this guy walked up and injected himself into the situation. He's like, you need to leave. And the guy, fortunately, the guy spun around and left. But when you do something like that, it's hard to back down from that. And there's no need to escalate a situation. Now you have, once law enforcement arrives or whatever, you literally have an opportunity with somebody, let's say that you've had a service disruption and you're not able to talk to this person. You've developed a policy and a procedure with your board. You've role played this out in your sanctuary with your pastor or whoever that you're reporting to. And you do it in a Bible study, uh, like a mock Bible study environment. And you kind of figure out what you're, what, what are you going to do? Maybe you have a pastor that is like, I'm going to talk to them if they interrupt me and I am fine with engaging with the crowd. Uh, if somebody wants to say something, that's what you think. I'm okay with that. You may also have a pastor that's like, no, if they interrupt, there's a lot of people in this room that want to learn. If they want to interrupt, um, I'm going to say, hey, I'll be happy to talk to you afterward. If not, if they're not listening, I'm going to ask you to leave. And at that point, you can walk up and be very professional and, and you know, and be nice. I hate to quote, <laughs> I hate to quote Roadhouse. Uh, it's not a great movie for many reasons, but there's a little gold nugget in there. And that is... Be nice. That's something that he taught his guys. Be nice. And um, you can definitely be nice and say, uh, listen, I apologize. Um, you've been asked to leave. Um, we can do this. We can do this very quietly and we can walk you out and you can have a great day. Uh, or if we involve law enforcement, there's a really good chance you're going to go to jail. And at that point, you need to have a, an officer in route just in case. And then once they get to the door, what's your policy? Do you have a policy for um, trespassing that person permanently? Or does your pastor want to try to engage with them later? Because there may be a ministry opportunity. 
And uh, if we if we think that the devil's never going to try to interrupt our church service, we need to look at the ministry of Christ and how many times somebody demonically inspired or inspired by their own pride, somebody demonically possessed, ended up interrupting Jesus's sermons when he was teaching or talking. So we I think we would be a little arrogant if we think that the devil's never going to try to interrupt what we're doing uh, for God. If, if they interrupted our Savior, they're probably going to try to interrupt us. And, and I've, we've dealt with service interruptions. And, and then having plans for within your sanctuary. There's, there's a million aspects and different directions these can go. But I want to bring this around because I, I touched on different topics. Like, what are you probably going to see with your church safety team? And then who don't you want on your team? Somebody who's only a hammer. Now, if somebody has a very specific mind, uh, very specific skill set, like I have a friend that got out of the military and did some incredibly high speed stuff. And he's like, there's not a lot of application in civilian life uh, in the United States for what I did. He said, most of what I did for the military is a felony here. <laughs> and so he's like, they, they kind of frown on you doing that. And I get that. But in, in, a case, in the case of an emergency, he's incredibly useful. Now, if that person wants to learn de-escalation and if that person has a ministry mindset, I deal with a lot of police officers who don't have a ministry mindset, but I deal with a lot of them that do. And so I remember getting so excited when there was a deputy at the door at our church and we had a guy, you could tell he was high. We were talking to him. I was getting ready to go engage him. I spoke to the deputy. He kind of watched my back. I'm going to go talk to this guy. And before I could even say, I'm going to go talk to this guy, this, this deputy is a believer. He attends our church and he gets paid every so often to guard the door. And he goes, has anybody just tried to walk up and talk to this guy? I'm like, hallelujah, a police officer in the ministry mindset. I love it. As a chaplain, that just blesses my heart. Um, our law enforcement have a lot of power, um, whether they realize it or not, in, in people's lives. And being able to look at that and use discretion is incredibly important. So if you have somebody that has a specific set of skills, like if you have IDPA competitive shooters in your church that have a sub one second draw, hallelujah get them some de-escalation training if if they're willing to go through that and if they will humble themselves and learn. And this is one of the things we've got to be so careful of is I've talked to guys that were bouncers that were the the brutalizing tough type of bouncer. And that 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 mindset has very little application. There's a very narrow lane that that's actually useful in. Um, they were tough and they could fight and they had won dozens of fights you have a particular skill set and you could be useful. But a lot of those guys, um, after they'd come to Christ, they actually realized that that those skill sets didn't have a lot of application in the church. And so in case of an emergency, motion that guy over and say, um, you know, this is Phil. He's one of the volunteers here at the church as well. Listen, I apologize. Um, because of disruption, the pastor's asked you to leave. Um, Phil and I are going to walk you out. Um, it, well, listen, if you refuse to leave, and I don't want this to happen, law enforcement's already on their way, and there's a good chance that we can just handle this, and you can go. Okay, well, we're going to have to escort you out. And then they go to take a swing, and Phil's on point. There is an application for those skill sets, but it's a very narrow window. And uh, I, I recently interviewed Stephen Williford, um, the, the barefoot warrior, the hero of Sutherland, the Sutherland Spring shooting. And he talks about that boredom is a blessing. You, you don't want bad things to happen. And this is where I'm going to come around and land this plane. Mindset, how we approach uh, church safety is going to determine what comes of it. Are we looking for an opportunity to minister to people? Or do we really want to trespass someone? Are we looking for an opportunity to lead somebody to Christ? Or do we want to get into a fight? Are we are we looking to pray with somebody? Or, or do we want to put somebody in an armbar and force them to the floor and hold them for the cops? Both are a potential, but what do we want to happen? And if we have this some weird, um, some weird daydream that's in our head about how we're going to run out and and save the day, and if if we're looking for that only, we're doing ourselves a disservice. And so mindset is incredibly important and all those other skills can be taught. I would rather have somebody who is of an intermediate level with their firearm skills and their hand-to-hand -hand skills, but has their de-escalation and medical game on point. And because odds are they're going to need those way more than the other. And um, there are skill sets we can get so far into, I jokingly call it halo knitting. And uh, where um, we're, we're using tools and equipment in our training, which the training can be incredibly fun, but there's probably not ever going to be an application for that. And I was talking to some friends of mine years ago about some of the weird training I've seen out there, some of which is pretty cool. 
And I'm like, it's kind of like halo knitting. And they're like, halo knitting? And I said, yeah, like you jump out of an airplane, high altitude, low opening, you're parachuting towards the earth, halo. And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, knitting. It's like, so you jump out of the plane and the instructor's like, okay, and here's how you knit an Afghan on the way to the ground. You're probably not ever going to need that. And so want, get, get your medical training, get your de-escalation training, get your, your fundamentals of firearms training, you know, get your, get your stop the bleed, get your uh, signs of a stroke, signs of a heart attack, get all those things covered and, and war game these things out and, and understand these situations. And like, I remember talking to a guy, he's like, yeah, we've, we've developed our trespassing policy as a church and I can't wait to trespass somebody. I lovingly had a conversation with him about what are we looking for here? Because what you're looking for, you're going to find, and you could be completely wrong. And I've done that. I've been completely wrong in applications. So um, you definitely don't want the ill-tempered man you also or woman. And you also don't want someone who is going to go off half-cocked. And I've worked with people before, and then, and then I'll be done with this podcast episode. But I've worked with people before that have scared me because of things they've said or done. You're like, um, what? And they, they go off half-cocked. And some people... That's an old saying for a weapon where it's on half cock. It's an old weapon uh, style, but you would bump it and then it would fire. Well, there are people that when they go off half cock, they just say something stupid. And then there are people that when they go off half cock, they're a howitzer, like boom. And the damage that can be done in a situation where somebody only has one or two skill sets and they have no communication skills and no ability to deescalate, we can end up on the news. So, we can literally be humiliated as a church and we can be sued. And this is becoming such a huge thing where imagine a, a security volunteer who is on, on the security roles, if you will, uh, listed as a security volunteer at the church. Now your church is being sued and you have to shut down your bus ministry. You have to shut down your outreach program. You can't take that mission trip to Uruguay that you do. Um, whatever that looks like, you can actually end up in a situation where that lawsuit, and you may be under a gag order, where literally you're not allowed to talk to your congregation about the fact that you were sued. And so people are like, why is this not happening? Why aren't we able to do this? The, the offering's coming in at this level, but and you're having to pay a settlement for, for years to somebody. Um, that's a very real situation. And so now imagine you've got someone who's who's got a hot temper, and they're looking, they're looking for a scrap, and they're walking up, you know, next... That's all they got right there. Well, we can put ourselves in that situation where um, that person comes up into that that situation and injects themselves in the situation and they're not even part of the team. And, and then they go hands-on or they haul off and hit the guy. Um, John Riley talks about a church where they were getting ready to escort somebody out. They surrounded them and made the person feel trapped. Always leave the person an exit if you can, if they're if they're not shooting at people and they're and they're not, they don't have a weapon and they're not trying to hurt anybody. And even then, if they if they not on the shooting part, but if they are willing to to start backing away from the church, maybe they pulled a knife or something, and you've got your weapon drawn. You're like, look, whatever that looks like. I'm I'm, I'm not trying to part, uh, paint hard and fast lines here, but in those situations, um, give the person a way out. So at John uh, John was talking about at this particular church that. Um, this individual was like, do not touch me, do not touch me, do not touch me. And somebody felt the need to reach out and touch him, this individual. And then there was this massive fight. The church lost face. There were people that were very upset about it. There were people that called in and said, hey, we're done with the church. So you can, you can, a lot of churches live stream now. So you can be publicly embarrassed. It can end up on the news. And then, and then your church is plastered in the news as having assaulted a guy. And you never know in, a, in a, a struggle like that, you may you may be doing everything in your power to not hurt this person. And they slip and fall and hit their head on a chair and hit the floor. And they've got a severe uh, traumatic brain injury. And you guys are paying their medical bills forever. When, when at that point, maybe the thing to have said was say, well, sir, we don't we don't want to touch you. So if, if you would like to leave, you've interrupted the service. The, the pastor's asked you to leave. Law enforcement's on the way. It's a pretty good chance they're going to touch you. So if you would like, we can, we can help you find the closest exit and, and you can have a great day. You know, you literally, what, what is it? Proverbs says a word aptly spoken is like apples of gold and settings of silver. It's of great value. And there is a time when that skill set, how we use our words, the, the book of James talks about the tongue holds the power of life and death. 
you know, you can steer a great big ship with a little bitty rudder, but a lot of people can't control their tongue. And so that's incredibly, incredibly important. So I hope somewhere in this, you can shake off what you don't need, that there's a couple of gold nuggets for you because prayerfully looking at who we put in a security role is incredibly important. They need to be able to talk to a child that's lost and looking for mom and make that child feel comfortable. Um, they don't need to be a flirt. They don't need to be aggressive. Um, they also don't need to be, they need to have a sheepdog mindset. And it, you can't have somebody that just wants to fill a spot. And so you, pr you need to prayerfully look at this. And then as churches, we really need to take their training seriously. We do ourselves a disservice as churches when we go, oh, we have a security team, check that box. They're responsible for all their training. That could be an incredible mistake. Just from a, a financial standpoint, from a lawsuit standpoint, it could be an, an incredible mistake not to get quality training. I literally have friends that are in law enforcement that have gone to church safety training where they've come out of it going, we need some of that in law enforcement. Like a lot of these smaller departments don't have the budget to go do some of those things. So de-escalation training and some of these different things, some executive protection training, different things like that, that I've seen brought into churches. I've seen law enforcement buddies go, dad gum, that was good. So don't forget to get the training for your people. And uh, it's a way to invest in that team and make them feel needed and wanted. But then when it matters, so if this is what a lawsuit's going to cost us, like millions potentially, right? How expensive does that training sound now, right? And we, I literally know of a church where a friend of mine told me, he said, I'm so brokenhearted. This was years ago. He's like, I don't even know what to do. He's like, my 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 church board and, and leadership, they don't take the need seriously for a security presence. And I'm asking for some training in these things, which was very logical. He, they weren't, they weren't, um, they weren't trying to train to be a SWAT team. They were just trying to train for very basic stuff. And the church was like, no, we don't have the money. And then bought like a $2,000 pulpit. They already had a pulpit, but they bought like a $2,000 pulpit. Um, I think that's what he told me it was. It was two or $3,000. And it really broke his heart because he's like, I'm just asking for some medical training and, and some, you know, and, and helping my team to learn how to defend our church better. He's like, I just don't think they get the need. So as churches, we really need, we really need to invest in those things. So um, I'm going to pray this one out. I hope that this blessed you in some way, gave you some things to think about. And uh, as you start your journey and, uh, or maybe you're partway through your journey and you're like, oh, I need to rethink some things. Sometimes you can move people to a reserve position if you have somebody that's maybe not quite where they need to be. So um, Lord God, I thank you for the opportunity. I'm humbled that you've given me a platform to speak to your people about, about church safety, about church security. This space is so important to me. And uh, Lord God, I ask that you, as always, help this podcast to reach the right ears, that you tell people to, to be able to have those aha moments and those gold nuggets would reach the right people. I lift this up to you in your son, Jesus name. Amen. God bless. This has been the Let's Talk About Church Safety and Security podcast. We hope this blessed you and we encourage you to like and share this episode with your ministry team.